Sunday, we invited uh, Dr. DeYoung to be with us to address a very important subject. The Bible calls on us to uh, preach the gospel, to share the good news with people. We believe that people need to be saved and come to know Christ as their Savior. Beyond that, the Bible also says we are to mature as believers and grow in the Word. And we, as we saw last time in 1 Peter, we are to, do, to defend the faith. We are to stand and uh, give a reason of the hope that lies within us. And so <clears throat> today, uh, we are going to do that in the subject of universal salvation. Um, I first uh, read Dr. DeYoung's book, and then I said to myself, man, I'd, boy, I'd like to talk to this guy. And so I tried to track him down, and I saw that uh, he was a professor at uh, Western Seminary. Matter of fact, for 40 years, he taught New Testament Greek there. And um, so when I called the seminary, they said, well, he just retired. And I said, well, do you have a number? They said, well, you give us your number, and then uh, I'll see if he wants to contact you. And so... Uh, Anyway, uh, ended up he did, and we talked, and uh, then I said, hey, would you be interested in coming out here? God has laid it on your heart to really be, I think, the, in my estimation, I, I don't know of anyone else that is more of an authority on this particular subject than the man you're going to hear today. And so, um, God in his, uh, by the way, we are going to be uh, answering questions. If you have a question, if something comes to mind, during this teaching time, write it down, turn it in at the information booth on the way out. We'll answer those tonight. But um, God in his sovereignty um, chose to counteract what I think the enemy was doing in, uh, with Paul Young in the writing of the shack uh, with a man that knew him intimately, had gone to Bible studies with him. Their kids had gone to the same Christian school. And he was able to write not only from a theological standpoint, but from a personal standpoint, understanding who this man was, and he is the one that has really led the charge in the whole universal salvation issue in America. So I am really thankful for um, Dr. DeYoung and his ministry and what God's doing through him still. And so let's give him a great hand as he comes. Thank you. In the year 2007, Paul Young published his book, The Shack. And since then, it has become a bestseller, selling over 20 million copies worldwide and influenced uh, churches around the world and individual Christians concerning universal reconciliation. So we want to talk about three more reasons why uh, this belief is wrong, is heretical, and should not be consumed and accepted by Christians. Thank you, Pastor Bruce. Uh, I've gotten to know Pastor Bruce uh, well yesterday in, uh, in several conversations, and uh, my wife and I flew in from uh, Portland yesterday. Uh, Pat and I have been uh, married for 56 years. She's been my faithful companion. You'd like to give us a hand for that? <laughs> She's over here. Uh, you know, interestingly, uh, we traveled from Portland to Missoula yesterday, and last night after eating dinner, we were walking across the parking lot, and lo and behold, up comes a car, stops right beside us, and we look in, and it's a couple from our home church in Damascus. <laughs> They did not know we were coming here, and we did not certainly know they were going to be here, and they're passing on the way through to get to uh, Minnesota. Uh, Pat and I have been uh, members of Damascus Community Church for 50 years 
uh, at least uh, this next month it'll be 50 years. Uh, I've taught a class there for uh, all those years, different Sunday school classes or other evening classes, whatever it may be, and that was coextensive with my teaching at Western Seminary. Western Seminary used to be known as Western Conservative Baptist Seminary, so it's very conservative and evangelical, but with the uh, changeover of our student body from just conservative Baptist students to all kinds of different evangelical students, we dropped those two words, conservative Baptist. But we're still conservative and we're Baptist, by and large. <laughs> uh, my acquaintance with Paul Young goes back to 2000, well, no, it goes back to 1997 at least, when he and I co-founded a forum called... Uh, uh, Millennium 3 Forum, and we sort of did that uh, with tongue-in-cheek because we are anticipating the next uh, millennium starting with the year 2000. So in 1997, we began that uh, uh, forum just as an exploratory time when people could get together once a month. We had 8 to 10 to 12 people who would meet, younger and older people, one a graduate of seminary like uh, I am and uh, others of different kinds and backgrounds. And we would talk about a whole variety of different topics. Uh, everything from uh, creation and trying to understand the six days of creation and the time of the flood and things like that, plus other more uh, difficult topics, perhaps. And all of a sudden, one day in the year 2007, pardon me, 2004, Paul Young read a paper, 103 pages long, or at least gave parts of it, dealing with the issue of universal reconciliation. That was the title of his paper. And in the first few pages, he said this, I am renouncing my evangelical background and embracing universal reconciliation. It has changed my life. I have been transformed by it. And when you read his biography, you understand what that means and how far reaching those statements are. Because Paul had a sordid sort of background as a missionary boy, uh, missionary parents in, in New Guinea. And in that setting, he even struggled with questions about how can the, the natives of New Guinea be lost unless they hear the gospel? That bothered him from the very beginning as a youth. And there are other things that I talk about in my response to his book. So Paul published his, well, he, he presented that paper that evening I was very much surprised by this. Uh, there was n no indication that uh, he was thinking along these lines. Paul and I had traveled every month together in the same automobile to these meetings. He lived only five miles from me. His kids went through the same Christian school in our church as my kids did. He never attended our church, however, never went to any of the services. And I found out later that's because he doesn't believe in the local church. Three institutions that he rejects, and it's stated in this book, uh, Burning Down the Shack, which I wrote in response to the shack. But in the shack, he says, three institutions of the church, the government, and marriage are demonic. God did not institute these. That's a lie. So I talk about that in my response called Burning Down the Shack. Now, you may be here this morning and have read The Shack and have been greatly impressed by it and think it's a wonderful book, a wonderful fictional novel. And on many occasions, Paul Young, going around the world, will say, uh, this is a book of fiction, and so forth and so forth. But he also said it's somewhat autobiographical. And now I understand why he said that. Because after reading The Shack myself, Realizing and realizing that it was filled with all kinds of undercurrents of universal reconciliation, it's really an evangelistic tool to win people over to universalism. And I say this: uh, if some of you uh, have been greatly, uh, uh, greatly have greatly admired the shack, and maybe attend a church even locally that uh, supports Paul Young and the shack. I hope that what we say this morning and again tonight will help you understand the truth of the matter. This is a wonderful church by all appearances. Pastor, uh, you have a wonderful group of people. You have a wonderful pastor. 
He's He's committed to the truth of the gospel, and every pastor ought to be above all other things. Now, we're living in a day, and I'll talk about this in greater depth tonight, in which there is a... all kinds of influences that are pointing us toward the last days. So I've written a book, The Apocalypse is Coming, and I'll talk about some of those things tonight. But the last days say, among other things, that there will be a departure from the truth. And people will turn to other avenues of understanding. And so it's especially crucial that churches in this day stand firm for the truth, being wonderful evangelists at the same time, and therefore... what I say this morning may touch your heart. And by the way, there are several, many young people here this morning. May I say that you have no greater opportunity to live your life for God than to dedicate yourself to Christ in your youth. I did that as a young person going to Bible camp, uh, going to church regularly, thinking that I was saved, growing up in a Christian home and my How my parents came to the Lord is a wonderful, wonderful story. It's so wonderful. My sister and I wrote a biography about my mom and dad. And uh, how they came to Christ and so forth, living outside of Chicago, is a wonderful story in itself. My aunt led my mother to Christ, and my aunt and my uncle, and their story has been broadcast on uh, the radio show, uh, Dear, what is it? Uh, James, Dobson. James Dobson's program, what was it titled? Uh, anyway, uh, it's it just a wonderful story. Uh, and so I encourage you young people, give your heart to the Lord while you have your youth. And it'll be amazing what God will do through you in the years that you have to give a life of your, uh, your life to him. Well, at this point... We want to come to our second presentation dealing with unmasking universalism. We're going through a great pandemic, the disease, COVID-19 and all of that, but there's a greater disease going on. It's a spiritual disease and it's much more serious and has serious consequences greater than that of COVID-19. And that's the heresy of universal uh, reconciliation. So we're unmasking universalism or universal reconciliation. It's an old heresy, an old disease that is now being reactivated chiefly through the writing of the shack. We'll say more about that tonight, but there's a long history of universal reconciliation as a heresy that goes back to the third century. So 1,800 or more years, the church has been wrestling with this. And we want to ask the question this morning in this second service, what additional truths of the Bible does universal reconciliation reject? In our first service, we dealt with three major issues, such as the meaning of the Trinity, as it's explained in the shack, or given forth in the shack, and as I address that in my book, Burning Down the Shack, uh, and two other issues we dealt with in the first service. Well, we're going to talk about three additional issues today, and these are issues that come about from this book, the second, uh, not the second book, but the, the fourth or fifth book that Paul Young has written. And this one, his book, was titled Lies We Believe About God. The book takes up 24 lies that you and I believe that are wrong and false. He believes they are lies, and he gives the correction to them. Such as, uh, sin separates a person from God. That's a lie, Paul Young says. The truth is, nothing separates us from God. Another belief that we have as evangelicals is that a person must become a child of God by being born again. That's a lie. Everybody's already a child of God. Nobody needs to be born again. We're already saved. Nobody's going to hell. And on and on it goes. I wrote a response to that called lies Paul Young believes about God. (laughs) But when you go out to the book table out there, your book will not look like this. Uh, your, your copy, and it is not quite titled that same way. This is the original title of my book, but Paul Young challenged me about this legally and threatened to take me to court because this book looks too much like his book. His has a diagonal like this, black and white, and the title sort of 
could confuse people, so he threatened to sue me over it. So the publisher who designed the book and so forth decided with me that we would uh, change the format and make it a square black and white tie <laughs> page and uh, slightly alter the title to... Uh, uh, re uh, uh, what, what is the cover there? Exposing. Exposing lies we believe about God. So uh, same content, same pages and everything except for the title page and the cover. So what are the additional truths that we want to deal with this morning? Uh, and by the way, as I shared in the first hour, the shack is in its second edition that was published for all the world to read. The first edition of the shack you never saw, and I've never seen. But I learned about it from the fact that he admitted that uh, the first edition was filled with universal reconciliation. So much so that two pastor friends said to him, look, if you want evangelical to read your book, you've got to eliminate or tone down the universalism in it. And so they spent a whole year, the three of them, rewriting the book. And the edition that finally saw the light of day is a second edition in which universalism is toned down, hidden, and made obscure so that people would buy it and read it, especially evangelicals. Those three men, Paul Young and two pastors, produced that effort, produced that book. Later on, a few years later, when the shack became a great, great success, those two pastors went to court to sue Paul Young for their share of the royalties. You don't know about that story. They settled finally out of court. But Paul had to admit that that, that, that issue of the shack is written by three people, not just Paul Young. That gives you some more background. Now, Paul Young and I were neighbors. As I said, our, our kids and his kids went through the same Christian school, but he did not attend the same, uh, did not attend our church because he's against institutions and so forth and so forth. So let's look at three uh, major additional truths uh, that I want to cover today. By way of introduction, here are some further uh, details of my involvement in exposing universal reconciliation. Now let me be very clear, and you should not forget this idea. The proper thing that we're talking about is universal reconciliation. It is not universalism per se. General universalism is not what Paul Young believes. And he'll get up in platform after platform and say, I am not a universalist. I do not believe in universalism. And he's correct. Because universalism, as a general topic, means that everybody, by all religions, are going to he is going to heaven. Everyone is uh, right with God. There's no torment or suffering or judgment after death. Everybody's going to heaven by e either Islam, Buddhism, Christianity, or whatever. That's general universalism. Universal reconciliation, or Christian universalism, says no, everybody has to come by way of Jesus to go to heaven. And if they don't do so while they're alive, then they will do so after they die by repenting and uh, God will accept their repentance and admit them to heaven, including the fallen angels and the devil himself. Eventually hell is emptied of all of its participants and heaven uh, is the destination ultimately of everybody. Now the major problem with that whole statement that I just made is that the Bible says nothing of that. The Bible never says that a person can repent after he dies and go to heaven. In fact, we're going to look at passages that say just the opposite of that. Ultimately, universal reconciliation, or Christian universalism, denies much of what the Bible has to say. So if you're just a good Bible student, you don't have much difficulty in finding out and discovering the truth about what we are talking about. So I just gave you point number two, reviewing distinctions of how universal reconciliation differs from universalism. And I could read some statements about that in my book, uh, In Exposing Lies uh, We Believe About God. Uh, number three, the further details of this defense of universal reconciliation is stated in his paper that he delivered in 2004. At that forum, he presented a 103-page paper, and uh, 
as I said, he embraced universal reconciliation and said, I'm renouncing my evangelical heritage. At the end of the discussion, after the whole hour was over with, there were several questions asked and so forth. I asked if I could present a paper in response to his, and I did the following month. I had never heard really of universalism or universal reconciliation. In all my many years of teaching, I'd never come across it. I'd heard about, you might say, in most oblique and, and general terms, but passed it off as nothing of importance. Well, I feverishly studied up for the next month and presented a 22-page paper the following month. Paul, did, Paul Young did not come. And after pursuing him for the subsequent meetings of our forum, he never returned. And after about six months, the whole forum fell apart because one of the co-founders had given up on it. So that gives you something of the brief history that I've had with Paul Young. Uh, one time when I met Paul after the forum had stopped meeting, we were in a church sanctuary or auditor or a foyer, and he said to me, Jim, remember, I am not espousing universalism. I'm espousing Christian universalism or universal reconciliation. And so that pointed me in the proper direction too, and that's what I'm trying to do this morning. So if you read Paul Young's writings or you hear him, remember he's talking about Christian universalism, but it's also a heresy. Here are a couple more points by way of introduction. Uh, I already dealt with point number four, that the shack as we read it is a second edition. Uh, Many times he will confront me in writing or otherwise saying, Jim, you're representing me wrong. I'm not a Christian universalist uh, or I'm not a universalist and so forth. He finally published his book, Lies We Believe About God in 2017. And on page 118, he had the rhetorical question asked of himself, Paul, do you believe in universal reconciliation? Answer, yes, that's exactly what I believe. So as I say in my essays about that, the cat is out of the bag. Uh, we finally know what Paul Young truly believes, and he's in print confessing it. And that ought to settle the question. Number six, there are all kinds of slanderous statements uh, recorded that I put in my book, Exposing Lies About God. May I share with you just a few of them? Uh, So I list, about, I list about 20 or more of these. I'm just going to read uh, a few of them. All people are fundamentally good because they were created in Christ. Those are his words. The golden rule is the way that God is. God treats me exactly the way God wants to be treated. You have to think about that. Uh, skipping down to some others. The image of God in us, due to creation, is not less feminine than masculine. The feminine, masculine nature of God is a circle of relationship, a spectrum, not a polarity. Think of those words, the feminine, masculine nature of God. Another question, where do you think sexuality originates? It originates in the very being of God. When the New Testament tells us that the divine nature of God has been placed within us, the Greek word used is sperma, or seed, and let's see, here's the truth. Every person who has ever been conceived was included in the death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of Jesus. We don't offer anyone who has already been given, we don't offer anyone what has already been given. We simply celebrate the good news with each one. The good news is this, we have all been included in salvation. Um... In reply to the question, who originated the cross, Paul Young replies, if God did, then we worship a cosmic abuser who in divine wisdom created a means to torture human beings in the most painful and abhorrent manner. Better know God at all than this one. 
Young's definition of sin, which is the Greek word hamartia, is this. Sin is anything that negates or diminishes or misrepresents the truth of who you are. It is not separation from God. It doesn't mean you're violated God's perfect standard. It means you're violating who God says you are and what God says you are is already you're a child of God. That's sin, to deny that. What a perverse twisting of the meaning of hamartia. Let me tell you about the God who actually showed up and healed my broken heart. Not the God I grew up with in my modern evangelical Christian fundamentalism. The God I grew up was, with was of little comfort. In fact, they, that God was considered the originator of evil, a distant deity who had a plan that included the torture of a child. One cannot run to God if God is the perpetrator. Frankly, I think those statements are blasphemous. So that's what Paul Young really believes in his book, Lies We Believe About God. I took every one of his lies, devote a chapter to each one, and answer them biblically what the Bible really does say. So those are some very slanderous things. So what are three more stark examples in addition to what we shared in the first service revealed in this book alone, Lies That We Believe About God, that show how universal reconciliation rejects biblical truths? Number one, who are the children of God? Is everyone? Secondly, what is the nature of sin? Does it separate from God? And thirdly, what is the nature of God? Did he plan the cross? So who are the children of God, first of all? The view of you are is that everyone is a child of God, whether or not he or she believes. Point number one that they maintain, no one needs to be born again to become a child of God because everyone already is a child of God. And two texts are cited to prove this. Let me just read to you from one, Acts 17, and the other is the statement in Ephesians 4, 5 through 6, that there's one baptism, one church, and so forth, and one God, the Father of all. And he's the Father of all. That means that all of us belong to him as his children, doesn't it? So Acts, let me read the passage in Acts 17, which is part of Paul's sermon on Mars Hill, a powerful, wonderful sermon, a model of what preachers ought to be preaching to a pagan audience and so forth. And we come to uh, verses 25 and 26 and 27. It's a powerful, powerful, theologically significant message that Paul gives to those Greek philosophers who thought they knew it all and they invited Paul. They, they, the invitation recorded here by Luke says that Paul was in the marketplace debating with people there, the philosophers and so forth, and they say to Paul finally, uh, and some of the Epicurean and Stoic philosophers as well were conversing with him, and some were saying, what could this scavenger of tidbits want to say to us, the philosophers? You could also translate that word literally, it's a seed spitter. A person who spits out seeds as though they had any merit. So they, it's translated by the New American as the scavenger of tidbits. It's a special Greek word. Others said he seemed to be a proclaimer of strange deities because he is preaching Jesus and the resurrection. And so they invite him to Mars Hill and he preaches and along the line, along the path, path, pathway, Paul says this, the God who made the world and everything that is in it, since he is Lord of heaven and earth, does not dwell in temples made by hands. That was a direct attack upon all the pagan deities enshrined in temples in Athens. Nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything. You see, false deities look for gifts, offerings, and so forth that be brought to them perpetually as though they needed those things. And Paul says... Our God does not need anything. Having determined their appointed times and the boundaries of their habitation, that they would seek God, if perhaps they might feel around for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. For in him we live and move and exist, as even some of your own poets have said, for we also are his offspring or descendants. 
Since therefore we are the descendants of God, we ought not to think that the divine nature is like gold or silver or stone, an image formed by human skill and thought, and so forth. And Paul goes on, and at the end he says, God has set forth a day in which he's calling all people to repent because he's going to judge the world in righteousness through a man whom he has appointed, having furnished proof to all people by raising him from the dead. And they cut off Paul at that point because in Greek philosophy and understanding, only Zeus ever came back from the dead. And, Jesus, and Paul was preaching Jesus to them and his resurrection. So they laughed at him. That was one reaction. Others said, we're going to come back again and hear more about this. And a third group, a few, says they believed. A few came to Christ at the end of that preaching. Well, Paul Young seizes the words in that declaration about we are all the offspring of God. And so he said, this proves everybody is a child of God. We'll go on here for a couple more uh, a slide. So here's the response to that, the truth of the Bible. And I say that faith is absolutely necessary to become a child of God. In a general sense, all are created by God, but they still need a spiritual birth. And what Paul Young and you are, universalism does with Acts 17, is to translate the word offspring by children. You can read Paul's uh, statement about that right in here. Doesn't discuss really the fact it means offspring, or descendants of God due to creation, but he says, we are children. He translates the verse with the word children. That's a violation of the Greek word. There are two different words. There's the word for children and a word for offspring, and Paul ignores what the Greek really says. And I ask the question, well, why would Paul, the apostle, share the need to repent on Mars Hill to these Greek philosophers, ask them to repent and believe in Jesus if they were already children of God? It doesn't make any sense. And the other passage, Ephesians 4, 6, which said that God is the father of all, is either the general sense of the creator of all, or more importantly, probably in the context, it refers to all those who are in the body of Christ. The whole context of verses 4 through 16 deal with the body of Christ. And that's of whom the father is father. Number five, the Bible affirms the essential need for faith. You know these passages, Ephesians 2, 8, and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith. How are you saved? Through faith, and not of yourselves, not of works, lest any man should boast. John 3, 16. In the first service, I read this verse and dealt with the terms of it in particular. For God so loved the world that he gave. We're going to find out tonight that universalism doesn't believe he gave his son. His only son, that whoever believes in him they reject belief in him, should not perish. They don't believe there's a perishing, but have everlasting life. They reject the term for everlasting. And you go on and read verses 17 and 18, and it talks about those who will not believe God is the judge of. Universalism says God is not a judge. And you read verse 36 at the end of the chapter, and it refers to the fact that those who do not believe that the wrath of God rests upon them. Universalism says God is not a wrathful God. So the most beloved verse probably of Christians in the New Testament in several of its details is rejected by universalism. Hebrews 11:6 6 says, without faith it is impossible to please God. Romans 10, 9 and 10 says, if you will confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. saved. Only then with that condition. And by the way, let me stop here and pause and say this. You may be attending this morning and are a person who's not sure of your salvation. I hope what we say this morning and tonight will add to your understanding of what it means to become a Christian. I think I started out saying already in this message that I was in the church once as a 12-year-old person growing up in a Christian home, and then I got talking about that. But I wanted to go on to say, I thought I was a Christian from about the age six or so when my mother led me to Christ. And one day at the age of 12, I was sitting in the back of the church, and I heard a visiting evangelist say something about the gospel. And 
and the Lord spoke to my heart. And I got home and I said, Mom, would you help me to become a Christian? And she said, Jim, you're already a Christian. <laughs> and I said, Mom, I think that if I were to die tonight, I would not go to heaven. Now, whether or not I would then, and so she led me to Christ again. So whether that was rededicating my life or for the first time becoming a Christian, I'm not sure. I think these are different experiences that we all go through. But it was a telling time in my life and changed the trajectory of me as a young person to consider serving the Lord full time. And so I ask you young people to think about that. So we've dealt with one major issue this morning, and that is uh, who are the children of God? Second big issue is, what is the nature of sin? Does it separate, separate people from God? The claims of universalism is that sin needs to be redefined, and it does not separate from God. A whole chapter is devoted to this in his book, The Lies. And by the way, I think I said this morning, but I'm not sure I said it to this group, that when we talk about universalism, we're talking about universal reconciliation, not general universalism. So here are the points that seemingly support that. The Greek hamartia means that one misses the mark of the truth of one's being. And the truth of one's being is that we are made in, the image, in God's image of being very good. Remember at the end of the conclusion of creation in Genesis 1, God says, uh, or the, the uh, reporter Moses talking about the creation account says, God said, it is very good. And that includes the making of humanity. So we are good. We are not fallen people. You skip over Genesis 3. And by the way, Paul Young has written two other novels. One is called Crossroads, in which over 12 times he dismisses the idea of eternal judgment. And then the second novel is Eve. Came out, both of those came out before his book, Lies We Believe About God. Eve is a rewriting of Gen Genesis 3. And, and of the creation account. Genesis 1. God creates Adam. No, wait a minute. That's not what happened, Paul says. Jesus Christ, who was present, became pregnant with Adam and gave birth to Adam. And then... Adam becomes pregnant with a woman and gives birth to Eve. Didn't sound like Genesis 1 to me <laughs> or Genesis 2. So this is the novel and he brings in all kinds of mythology and pagan belief to rewrite the creating of Adam and Eve. So sin does not, hamartia does not mean that one misses the mark of God's perfection, but the truth of one's being, that we are made in God's image of being very good. And number two, separation is a lie. Separation is a delusion. None has ever been separated from God, page 232. That's universalism. Another claim, everyone needs to simply uncover who they already are. There's no need for transformation. He was interviewed on the Oprah Winfrey show a few years ago and came away from saying, I would like to be like Oprah Winfrey. And so he shared on the program that there's no need for transformation. We already are the children of God. This is the gospel, the good news. The good news is declared to go around telling the world, you are children of God. You were made in, in God. When he created, you were created in him. Which reminds me of something I'd like to say about that. So you will find in this copy of the book out there for sale a sheet like this and it's titled Disturbing Points for Pondering. Number one, people have a relationship with God who is a sexual being. Number two, the divine nature has been placed in all humanity. Chapter 11, that's what we're talking about right now. 
The God of evangelical Christian fundamentalism is the originator of evil. And we'll talk about that tonight. I think that these words, this is, these are now my words, mean that Young throws God under the bush, under the bus, to use a contemporary phrase. Number four, the whole creation was created in God. Not only humanity, but all of creation. If that's the case, this would allow for deified zebras and monkeys. That's humorous. I thought you'd laugh. <laughs> <laughs> but that would be one of the conclusions. Christian teaching regarding the judgment at the cross makes God a cosmic abuser who has tortured his child Jesus. Number six, God is an artist, not a planner. He often needs to change his plan. The good news is to tell all people that they are already saved even without believing. Chapter 25. So instead of our defining the good news as the fact that Jesus Christ has come to save us from our sins, and if we put faith in him, we would be saved for all eternity, that's not the good news. The good news is to tell people they already are God's people and God's children. And number nine, sin is not missing God's standard of perfection, but is diminishing the truth of who a person is, that he or she is already in relationship with God. The Greek word hamartia does not mean that at all. So we want to move to a second topic, or no, the same topic. So what does the Bible have to say about the need of redemption that all, it said that we are all lost, dead in sin. Hamartia does mean to miss the mark of God's standard of perfection and holiness. Secondly, all are lost because of Adam and Eve's fall, Genesis 3. They are dead in sin, Romans 5, Paul's Paul the Apostle's teaching. And the exception of those are those who receive Christ as Savior. They're not dead in sin, but they've been resurrected out of that by putting faith in Jesus Christ. And thirdly, prior to conversion, all are separated from God. Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And there's a verse in, the, in Isaiah 59.2 that your sins have separated you from God. The exact words, and Ephesians 4.18 has that same thought that we were dead in sin and lost outside of the gospel. So my response is that universalism is humanistic. Notice that it def defines sin to be people's wrong thinking about themselves rather than wrong thinking about God. It is close to the serpent's lie of Genesis 3. Has God said this? The serpent said to Eve. And you are is saying, has God said this to you and me today? A second thought on this slide. You are's redefinition of sin makes the atonement, the death, and resurrection of Christ unneeded, unnecessary. And if you think that's exaggerated, I'll say more about that tonight. You are also denied that hell is separation from God, a whole chapter devoted to that. So a third major topic here is what is the nature of God? Who is God? Why did the cross take place? Number one, you are asserts several statements that seek to redefine God and his deeds, what he has done. These are critical errors. First of all, in the nature of God, he describes as feminine masculine with whom people have a relationship. It doesn't go beyond that to say much, but it leaves open the door for all kinds of aberrant thoughts. Number two, God is not one alone, as though he's singular, but one with whom, Paul says, we people have a relationship with. So Paul Young rejects the God of his modern evangelical Christian fundamentalism, almost in the last uh, page of the book, this God is the originator of evil who tortured his child and God cannot be anything that is not love. Still further statements about God. God is not in control of everything. God is an artist, not a planner. The cross was evil. 
and not part of God's plan. Why, I always thought it was. God does not have a plan for our lives. Remember, he's an artist, not a planner. God submits to human plans. God reigns by being who he is, which is defined as love and relationship. Number five, the cross was man's idea. God did not originate the cross. God took it over, but it was not in his plan. What did Jesus say? I have come to die on a cross. He said that on several occasions. That's why I've come into the world. Well, according to Paul Young, that's not the case. If God, if God did originate the cross, then God is a co cosmic abuser, a cruel, monstrous God, and better no God at all than this one. But the Bible makes statements that are just the opposite of these. God is sexless, neither masculine nor feminine. Number two, only Christians have a relationship with God by virtue of their being in Christ by a new birth and making them adoptees in God's family. Here are the verses from John, from Galatians, and Romans saying we've been adopted into his family. They are in Christ and he is in them. And this reciprocal relationship we have with Jesus Christ is true also of the Father because the Father is in him. And these are the verses from the Upper Room Discourse, John 14 and 17. Everything is in God's plan. Some things are there determined by God, and some things are allowed by God, such as sin. But it's all in part of God's plan, because he's omniscient and omnipotent. God's purpose will always prevail. Great passages from Isaiah and Daniel. Roman Daniel 4.35 as King Nebuchadnezzar saying, God does as he pleases in heaven and earth, and none can stay his hand. Romans 9.21 and Acts 17 again from the uh, discourse of Paul on Mars Hill. Ephesians 1.11 and finally Revelation 17.17. 17. Uh, that verse, by the way, talked about how the Antichrist is, and his uh, his power and, and deceit during the time of the Great Tribulation, near the end of it, he's going to turn against world religion and crush it, depicted as a harlot. And uh, it says that when they do this, it fulfills God's purpose to end world religion that denies him. So even the Antichrist fulfills God's plan. So the cross was purposed by God to accomplish atonement for sinners. This is the real meaning of the cross. Acts chapter 2 from the Apostle Peter. Romans 3.25, a great passage from Paul the Apostle, that the cross is part of God's plan to deal with sin. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him to be sin for us, that, he, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. God is not only love, but holy and just. Number four, God does not submit to human plans. He doesn't need to because he is omniscient. He knows everything. And he's omnipotent to bring everything to pass. So what is happening today in the world on, what is today, July the 25th, is all part of God's plan. And tomorrow and all the days to come to the end of the age when the end of history takes place. And Jesus Christ returns at the Battle of Armageddon, puts down world rebellion, and comes to reign for a thousand years. Premillennialism. Before, before the end of that time and the creation of new heavens and new earth, praise the Lord. Number four, God, I just read that, because God is omniscient and omnipotent. He doesn't need to submit to human plans. They're all part of his plan. God originated the cross as the means by which to uh, in the person of Christ, he judged and dealt with sin. Sinful man would never have thought of the cross or the way of atonement, except as it was projected in the Passover feast to the nation of Israel in the Old Testament. So I make the point that you are, has joined the Pharisees in their spiritual blindness. Remember, they were the most informed religious people of the day, but they missed Jesus Christ, they missed the cross, 
and all of that. Several New Testament writers interpret Isaiah 53 as fulfilled in Christ. Paul said that Isaiah 53 has been wrongly applied by Christians to Jesus Christ. Penal substitution is denied. Rather, the truth is, it is biblical. 2 Corinthians 5.21, he made him to be sin in our stead, that's substitution, so that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That's the judgment of Jesus. That's the judgment of God to apply Jesus Christ's work to us. And Jesus suffered the penalty, the eternal penalty for our sins. So we believe in penal substitution. Paul Young says it is wrong because it involves judgment. And finally, the cross represents God's judgment against sin. You want to understand the meaning of the cross? Look what it cost God, his only son. And he was separated from him, momentarily at least, at the cross. And Jesus, as an adult, voluntarily went to the cross. He did not go as a child, as a child sacrifice, as Paul sort of terms it. He even goes so far as to say that the idea of sacrificing Isaac on the cross, uh, 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 offering up Isaac as a sacrifice, was Abraham's idea, not God's. That's wrong. And finally, number seven, at death, one's destiny is sealed. You all know what Hebrews 9.27 says. It is appointed unto men once to die, and after this, the judgment. So I'll conclude here, okay. and uh, then we'll turn it back over to your dear pastor. Jesus, as an adult, not as a child, voluntarily went to the cross, and God commanded Abraham to offer si sacrifice, and so forth. Now, there are additional things here in the conclusion, but we'll stop here. You all have access to printed copies of everything that I've been sharing on the overhead, so uh, you can look at the conclusions there. If you think this uh, doesn't relate to us or uh, our community, there's a large church in town that is teaching this doctrine. And um, so I want you to know this is critical to your faith and to uh, uh, our defense of the gospel. Also tonight, I hope you'll come back 6 o'clock. Uh, if you have a question, write that down, uh, turn it in to us. We'll be glad to try to address those tonight. And uh, we are receiving a love offering uh, for uh, Dr. DeYoung as um, you're leaving today. I, um, uh, I'm thankful for this church's uh, commitment to Christ and to the Word of God. Uh, it's what we stand on. We don't uh, give you our opinion. We open the scriptures up and say this is what the Word teaches. And uh, there's a lot of gray areas that people have as believers. We can differ on a lot of things that are secondary to uh, what we feel like is critical to the gospel. But when it comes to the cross, you cannot be wrong on that. And, um, and it's one thing to personally be wrong. It's another thing for me to be convinced and then to tell you and try to persuade you and deceive you and blind you. That is the worst thing that a person can do. And uh, I believe the severest judgment of God will be upon people who do that. And so this is a serious thing that uh, we are dealing with, and we hope that even though this was a lot of teaching and pretty heavy stuff for a lot of you, I hope that God used it in your life to strengthen your faith. Uh, so I'm going to ask to, again, uh, Dr. Jim, why don't you slip out and let's stand. We'll be dismissed in prayer. Hope that you'll grab some of his books, have him sign a copy. Uh, before you leave, and um, I hope that you'll enjoy the fellowship uh, afterwards. Let's uh, pray together. Our Father, we are <clears throat> indeed thankful for the clarity of your word, thankful for men that have given their life. Um, Jim DeYoung has given his entire life to teach the Bible, and I just uh, pray and thank you for his fervency, his accuracy, and pray the Spirit of God would use it in our life to help us to know uh, our own faith and then to be able to share that with love to others. 
Bless us as we leave. We'll thank you and bless the service tonight in Jesus' name. Amen.